Hello, my name is Jennifer Chavez. I'm a member of the board of the Women's Liberation Front. And also here today with me is my dear colleague, Natasha Tart, who is the chair of the board. Today, we're hosting this discussion to focus on an urgent issue, the policies or practices that allow men to be housed in women's jails and prisons based on their claimed gender identity. This issue is especially pressing because at the time of this recording, the California legislature is poised to vote on a bill called SB 132, which would allow incarcerated individuals to self-identify as transgender or intersex. And the bill would mandate that the individuals who so self-identify then be housed at a correctional facility designated for men or women based on the individual's preference. This includes sex-specific residential programs, such as the Community Prison Mother Program. SB 132 further mandates that such individuals have their perception of health and safety given serious consideration in any bed assignment or placement or program, programming decision within the facility, but it doesn't mention or mandate that prison officials uh, give serious consideration to the perception of health and safety of other individuals who would have to live with them, particularly incarcerated women. Of course, the fact that this bill is so close to passing demonstrates that the California legislature has completely failed to consult with the women's prison population to ask whether they are willing to be placed with men who claim to have a woman gender identity. Based on discussion of the bill in the media, it's obvious that the bill is being driven by gender activists who are working primarily in the interests of men who claim to identify as trans women. Some of these men who today are typically housed in special separate facilities and given separate programs within men's prisons complain that they should be housed with women in order to reduce the threat of violence that they uh, face in men's facilities, which is of course a serious problem and needs to be addressed. The only trans identified female that we've seen quoted in the news reports insists that the bill would be a disaster. Um, she said, I already fight for my life in this prison. How do you think I'm going to fare in a male institution? And uh, she said, there's not a hormone shot in the world that would give her a chance of surviving in a men's prison. Our guests today have firsthand experience with this issue as feminist activists in Canada. Heather Mason is a founding member of the group Canada, uh, excuse me, Canadian Women's Sex-Based Rights or COSBAR. COSBAR is a cross Canada nonpartisan coalition of women and male allies working together to preserve sex-based rights and protections for women and girls. Heather was incarcerated for a time at the Grand Valley Institution for Women in Ontario. After kicking her drug habit, she became an advocate for women in the criminal justice system with a particular focus on the failure of the prison system to treat addiction and other mental health problems and on the issue of men self-identifying into women's prisons. April Halley is a writer based in Canada she became particularly interested in this issue of men and women's prisons, and she made a splash last year when she publicly confronted Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau over it, after the media had completely failed to question or report on the proposed policy. April has done crucial work to uncover and report on details about how the Canadian correctional system has been implementing its gender identity policies as well as reporting on the experiences of women who have been forced to live incarcerated with men. Wolf is deeply thankful to April and Heather for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over to Natasha to get the conversation started. Thank you so much, Jennifer, appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, April and Heather for joining us. Um, can you each tell us roughly when you learned about the current Canadian policies on gender identity in prisons and how you became involved in fighting back against that and educating the public? Well, uh, okay, so I first learned about it. Um, I learned about them 
um, incarcerating men that identified as women in 2015 in provincial jail. But I didn't really understand what was going on. And at that point in time, I was still mixed up with drugs, so I didn't pay attention. But when I was actually in prison um, when they changed policies at um, Correctional Services of Canada. So we actually watched it on the news after the Justin Trudeau um, town hall meeting. So they ended up playing it on the news and that's how we found out about it. And uh, women in the UK told me about the policy and that it was in Canada and I didn't believe that that could be true because I thought, you know, if this is happening, obviously it would be front page news and everyone would know. So I thought I, they, I thought they must have gotten their wires crossed and it couldn't possibly be true. But I thought I would look into it anyway, which I did. And to my shock, I found that was happening and it had been happening for, well, about two years at that point. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I feel like that's a common reaction with a lot of people that we talk to still and I, I remember having some of that reaction like oh that can't be true everybody would know about it but but then it is and nobody's talking about it so it was a conversation I had with a cab driver because I tell everyone I meet that this is happening because uh, someone has to do it the news isn't doing it and that's what he said he said fake news and I'm like though the information that I obtained regarding the number of men in women's prison uh, came from the government it was an access to information request so it's not just you know, something I've read on Facebook. I mean, I can understand why people are concerned about, you know, you know, phony news and stuff because of social media and stuff. But even when, yeah, faced with hard facts, people find this issue hard to grapple with. That's right. Um, how are incarcerated women dealing with this? And is anyone listening to their concerns? Have you been hearing from women who are, are currently living with men in these facilities either of you yeah so i um i still talk to all the women that i was incarcerated with so even when i was in um it's really really hard to get into um, mental health services there you have to qualify so typically you need to be suicidal um or like a danger to yourself or um, have like severe mental illness in order to get a counselor, but they also don't do trauma counseling in prison. So they say it's not a safe environment for it. So they won't provide any programming to deal with um, trauma or if you are triggered. Um, so a lot of the women don't have anywhere to go, um, no one to talk to. And then when people are saying something, so even with the grievance that was filed, um, the woman was told that it was due to Bill C-16 and that's why that person is in the institution. But it's like a cop out. Um, they just tell you, well, according to our policies and all of this, they have the right to be here. But those same policies apply to protect the women and they're not protecting the women. So it's, they're doing one above the other. So it doesn't matter about how the women feel, what is happening to the women, and there's no services provided. So anyone that does speak out about it is called transphobic. And um, to my knowledge, I don't know of any women that who have spoken out that have actually like gotten support for it. That's why a majority of the women talk to me because I'm the only one that they can trust to talk about it and not be releasing their names or calling them names for saying something. Right. The grievance she talked about, that woman, she um, uh, she was harassed in prison by a man named Matthew Harks, who is a serial predator who has uh, admitted to assaulting 60 girls. And so he honed in on her and was harassing her and making lewd comments. And this causes a, you know, a deterioration in her mental health. And so then but th so it ends up, she ends up getting in trouble and threatened with segregation because she's having these behavioral issues because she's so triggered and have, you know, has no recourse. So this is, um, and this is someone who, when he was placed there, they were told not to judge him or, or he would be referred to as her by his crimes. So you're kind of putting these, the pressures on the women to accept these men as women and they don't have, you know, anyone to take their part. And she filed a, a grievance um after so she filed a formal complaint 
but she'd done that when she was out of uh, CSD's auspices. And that's an important point because women are really in a pickle because they're afraid, understandably, to go up against corrections while they're inside or even while they're still under, you know, their observation because they don't want repercussions. So that's why Heather is so special and amazing to speak up because, you know, people are just afraid. And But this one went through the process of filing the formal complaints and reading it is a harrowing um, thing. And uh, Matthew Harks, is this the the same person who's uh, like there are news stories about a Madeline Harks? Yes. In the press, is the same. So this is this is a yeah. man who was released into the community, and it was so alarming to the people in that town that he was sent back to prison because they were afraid, and the outcry, and the backlash was so bad. He's sent back to prison. With women? Well, yes, well, what happened so, is, oh, sorry. So I was just gonna say, so Matthew Harks um, has been incarcerated for years for this and he um, committed his offenses as a man. But um, probably about four years ago, he got sex reassignment surgery. So technically he's viewed as a woman. And that is why he keeps being transferred from um, each women's institution in halfway house and having the same sexual assault, grooming, sexual harassment, like all of these things. And they're allowing it because technically he's a woman. And it's just so crazy that they know that this person, even though they've had sex reassignment surgery, still is a predator and has male pattern behavior and cannot be around the women and they still put him with the women and there is also another sexual assault at grand valley and the woman was brought out to the sexual assault clinic at the hospital in kitchener um and there is uh there it was uh, mentioned in the parole board decision, but there's also more documentation about it and um with her case um, there was no, no supports provided, so no counseling, um, nothing. So she ended up having, I guess, triggered behavior. So she acted out and she got into an argument with another woman. She ended up being maxed out because she didn't know how to cope with what had happened to her and she wasn't offered any support. So because that happened, she acted out due to like a traumatic response. Um, she was punished, mm -hmm. and it ha and it happens a lot. It happens more than people think because the women can't say they can't mention that it's a trans woman. So most of the time, when people are like t discussing things, they're saying it as this is a man that's doing it. But then CSC and everyone else is coming back and saying, well, no, that's a woman. So it's no different than any other woman doing it. And it's like, no, that's not what it is. That person actually has a penis and they're still a man and they're doing these things to the women. And then if the women retaliate, then they're called bullies or they're accused of discriminating against um, these trans women, right? So there isn't really a whole lot happening other than them being told to behave and to be quiet. Right. And going back to what you mentioned, Natasha, about, um, you know, the community being so horrified that he was sent back to prison, what happened is they release, sometimes when they release a violent offender, such as Mr. Harks, they'll release a community service advisory. So that's what they did when he was released in Ontario. And someone saw him have an interaction with a child, which was a violation of his probation. So he was sent back to prison. So then when he was released again uh, in Vancouver, uh, a community service advisory wasn't released. And now I believe that was because of the kerfuffle that happened in Ontario, because that was even in his, in his parole record, how, you know, it caused a bad public outcry and stuff. So this, this is how it's being dealt with now in Canada. So he was released in Vancouver and they just didn't release, they didn't um, release that information to the public, despite that he is an obvious, you know, pernicious threat. I mean, to young girls in particular. Uh, so when I knew he'd been released in Vancouver, like I, um, I, I had confirmation of this, but I wanted to just confirm it from Federal Corrections, just to double check it. And I contacted uh, the British Columbia 
branch of the correctional service. And I asked them, you know, if he was still under their auspices. And she told me that because he was a woman, she couldn't tell me that, which was such a weird thing. Yeah, it didn't make any sense to me because I'd gotten similar information from other provinces. And because this is federal corrections, that's standard across the country. So it's like, that can't be right. And when I referred to him as a man, she, I was being chastised then by the woman over the phone who worked for the, oh. for, yeah. She's like, why are you referring to him as a man when he's a woman? I'm like, he has assaulted 60 girls. He has assaulted women in prison. He's harassed women in prison. Despite the fact that he has removed his genitals, that doesn't stop someone from being a deviant and an offender. And there are many ways you can assault and harass people. And this is what, so, this is a point that is sometimes lost, uh, that even there's no evidence whatsoever that a man who's had genital reconstruction is suddenly safe to be with women. He's not, and Matthew Harks is a testament to that. So when I got the phone with that woman, I was astounded. So I called the Access to Information Act, uh, um, Department of Correctional Service, and they told me immediately that, that wasn't true, and they confirmed that he'd been released. So it was just such a really weird thing. Like British Columbia is one of the, you know, areas of Canada that seems the most ideologically um, taken over by this kind of strange belief system. Right. And does does a a man like Harks does he get more favorable treatment in a women's facility than he might if he were in a men's facility other than access to potential victims? Is there, are there other benefits? Well, anyone who says that they have an alternative gender, what, and it's defined very broadly, um, you, what, they, what they refer to as gender considerations, you'll get a file, an individual protocol, I think it might be called, where you'll have some say over strip searches and different things like that. So I look at that as very manipulative because when you are a prisoner, you have all your rights taken away from you and you have no choices. So they want to make this attractive. So like, even if you want to stay in a prisoner, a prison that accords with your sex, you can still say that you are, have these gender considerations and get listed as this kind of, uh, as this new kind of strange, you know, category. It's just a very strange thing. Right. Well, or like, you know, a, a dangerous male offender like this, it sounds like they might be locked up in something like a supermax facility, perhaps, if they were in a men's prison. And I don't think there are a lot of facilities like that, if I, if I understand correctly, even in women's prisons. The supermax? Mm -hmm. Or you cut out a little bit. Or, you know, where, where... Yeah, where where in a men's facility like here, you know, there's different levels of of higher security that generally speaking in a women's prison there there isn't that they're more like that most women's facilities are run kind of like residential dormitories, a lot of them, and they just don't have the same kind of lockdown that you might have in a in a men's prison in all cases. Is that a parallel? Yeah, so uh, in Canada, women don't have a super max. Um, men do. Um, and then also our security is a lot less. So the guards don't have weapons. Um, and there's like only one fence instead of a whole bunch of fences. There's no wind towers. Um, they're not supposed to um, use violence with us. They're supposed to uh, talk things through and out. Um, so there's a lot of differences with women. There, we have a lot of freedom. There's a lot of things that we are able to do because we pose a uh, much less risk compared to the men. Um, and at one point in time, we didn't even have, after they closed for women in Kingston, we didn't even have maximum security unit. Um, there was a couple incidents that happened where they wanted to make it. So for the longest time, uh, Grand Valley in Ontario only had like a white fence around it. But once they built the max unit, then the community wanted a better fence around the prison. Um, but there's a lot of differences between men and women. So even in the provincial level, with two less a day, um, we're allowed to have razors um, change out with the other prisoners, whereas men are really locked in their cells with the razor because they're not trusted to be um, unlock at the razor. So there's a lot of differences that I can talk about with security with the women and men. And that's because women are incarcerated 
for different reasons and we're less violent compared to the men. Right. So it, it is kind of the same where they're, they're moving to lower security facilities in general with, with mm -hmm. such transfers. Where if a man identifies as female, he's going to a, a female facility, he's going to, to be moved into a lower security environment, almost by definition. Yeah. Well, it's, at some of these places, they have no ability to deal with these offenders. Uh, there was one Quebec offender named John Boulachanese, I believe is how you pronounce it. And he, um, he's a, you know, convicted of homicide and he debated custody for a very long time. And while in custody, he's made very, you know, very elaborate escape attempts, you know, creating a shiv and jumping out of a van. Like he's someone who requires a heavy level of surveillance. And a Quebec judge actually said he should be accommodated because in prison, he said he's a woman all of a sudden and he should be sent into a woman's prison. So there, in this case, the federal corrections, which called the Correctional Service of Canada, they didn't want it. But so they're really in a pickle. They've had this thrown at them basically. But then that judgment was overturned, but it shows how vulnerable this is. When you have you know, very extremely violent uh, men trying to get into women's prisons and there's no ability to, as you say, with the security issues. But I found it interesting in that case, ultimately, as far as it stands now, he's not being allowed to transfer. And I think mm -hmm. the wider community, uh, you know, played into a role in that because if he broke out, which he would, you know, if you read about this guy, you'd be like, he won't last never very long. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was listened to, but no one is doing it for the incarcerated women. You know, the same level of threat exists for them inside and they can escape, you know, for these men like Matthew Harks. So it's just, uh, it's good that they're taking into account the wider community, but, you know, in stopping that transfer, but why not, you know, it just flabbergasts me. Right, right. And the Which, fact that um, they don't have any policies in place that prevent the transfers. So anybody is eligible to apply transfer if they identify as a woman. There's no stipulation saying if you are a rapist, or a pedophile, or you have violence against women, like you're not allowed to apply. Mm -hmm. So the, anyone can just apply. And then it's based on one person's judgment of whether or not they would be a good fit in the prison. But the issue that we have, that's great. Let's make policies to put in place so those people aren't in. But there's also people who are incarcerated that are in for crimes that are not those, that are inside harassing the women, actually assaulting. For instance, the one I was just talking about who goes by Sam. Sam was in bank robberies. Like, so how do you, how do you put policies in place that prevent these people? You, you basically have to say, no, can't come in. Like they, they're not able to pick and do. So you can't do that because you don't know who is going to do something until they do it. And we're having a lot of issues with uh, people just pretending that they're women. Like Sam, for instance, Sam has spent 20 years in male institutions and now all of a sudden is a woman, but still has a penis, is not on hormones. Like it's, it's, it's just crazy. Like we all know that if given the opportunity, someone's going to play the system. And this is perfect for people to take advantage. So you can go ahead and increase all these sentencing for, say, pedophiles, or this, make them stay in jail for 10 years. What good is that when they're transferring to men's institutions? Now they're incarcerated with women and children. It's a true. And people don't get it. The, um, the, the bill that I mentioned at the top of, of the discussion in California, SB 132, is very similar in that it places all the burden on, it just assumes that a transfer will be granted and it puts the burden on uh, some unnamed prison official to justify a denial of, of, uh, of a preferred placement. Um, I'm not even sure if there is a specific mechanism in there to prevent a transfer, but there are, there is a little bit more room under the law for, for a prison official to, to uh, deny uh, preferences as to where they sleep and, and how, how exactly they're placed within the facility 
But as far as them coming in in the first place, it's kind of just assumed that it will be granted. And, um, you know, something else that's similar, um, you know, there are, of course, especially in the state of California, just because it's so massive, there are, um, there are hundreds, I want to say over a thousand um, males who currently identify as transgender incarcerated in, in, um, in California prisons, but not all of them, you know, some of them are saying, yeah, that would be wonderful to, to be placed in a women's prison because then I wouldn't have as much threat of violence um, to myself. Um, but some of them think, no, it's a nutty idea. Some of them think, no, I'm, I'm actually comfortable where I am. And, um, and so it's, it's really a strange situation because I think everybody except for the sort of ideologically driven activists understands that, uh, you know, there is actually a population of men who will do and say anything that they can to mm -hmm. get access to new victims. Um, and that's just not acknowledged in, in the discussion at all. No. Because, it, yeah, it's, it's, in Canada, it's not a discussion we've had at all. So this California bill, that's a bill specifically in regards to prisons? Am I going to have that correct? Yeah, any, any um, you know, prisoner jail under the jurisdiction of the state of California. So federal facilities that are located in California wouldn't, be covered by the bill, but it, but you know all of the facilities within California that are under the state's jurisdiction. And just for context, um, currently the number of women incarcerated in California is almost ex almost exactly like within twenty um, the number of women incarcerated in the entire UK, mm -hmm. and that is that's after um, they had massive releases because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So at the beginning of this year, California had substantially more women incarcerated than the, the entire UK. So it's, you know, it's something that I think, you know, California is a unique place for a lot of reasons. And one is just that it's so populous and so massive that just this one state law affects, you know, almost the same way it would an entire country in another context. I think the population of California might even be bigger than Canada. It's quite large, yeah. It's what? it's similar, a little larger, but it's roughly, it's equivalent, but similar. Wasn't, well, well, I asked about the law because it's important to point out that there is no law in Canada regarding male prisoners in women's prisons. It's something that people, what has happened is we passed a law, uh, Bill C-16, which uh, added gender identity and expression as protected grounds for discrimination. But what does that mean? So even when that was passed, the Correctional Service, um, you know, they updated their policy in regards to trans prisoners when it came to sexual reassignment surgery. So previous to uh, this bill, uh, a prisoner who had lived in their gender, whatever that means, for 12 months outside of prison could obtain sexual reassignment surgery in prison and the, you know, we, the government would pay for it because the policy that had been in place formally since the 1980s where a man who had changed his genitals would could be housed in a women's prison. So it's actually been there for a long time, but it's something that would only affect an infinitesimal number of prisoners. So, but then we have Bill C-16, which protects at these discrimination uh, protection, but there is no discussion whatsoever about prisons. Like this would not enter anyone's mind. Most people's like, no one knows this. And even when it was passed, the correctional service, they changed their policy, as I said, but they maintained the original policy, which was a man with a, full, a fully intact man would go to a men's prison. So they announced this policy change uh, in January 9th, uh, 2017, uh, which would just keep the same policy. But then a couple of days later, uh, the Prime Minister Trudeau went to a town hall so, that Heather alluded to, where he was asked questions, and a man stood up and he asked, he said, he identified himself as a trans woman, and he was very concerned about trans women in men's prisons and stuff, and he asked the Prime Minister what he would do about this, and the Prime Minister said he'd never thought about it, but trans rights are human rights, and this is the type of thing we should be moving forward on, even without him leaning in on it, but he was going to 
you know, and literally the next day, the policy was changed. So to self ID. Wow. So the, the and it's not even it, no go ahead. It's not even about trans women or trans men or non binary, like all about trans men. Like this bill gave them the opportunity to transfer because they're not transferring anyone who was born biologically female. So if you identify as a man or you identify as nothing, if you have female sex body, you're not get transferred. You're going to settle it informally so that you don't transfer. And if you do transfer, you're being in segregation because of safety issues of being raped by men because you're still viewed as a female. But then they will turn around and tell me that trans women are women, even with penis and can come into our prison. How one-sided is this? And why, if it really is about trans rights, why is no one advocating for the trans men to be able to transfer? Because there have requests, and why are you not advocating that they not be placed in segregation? You're so worried about trans women being having their own wing and being segregated, but you're not concerned about the trans men that are segregated. But nobody wants to talk about that. So. Do you feel like with any of these stories that have come out, how do you feel that the media is doing in informing the public in Canada about this? Have there been any improvements? Have there been any changes? Do you feel like people are talking about it at least more or what, what do you think? No, people are not talking about it at all. I mean, what you can, I don't know. It's, there, what coverage does exist is meager and slanted to the point of propaganda. And it, I, I don't use it lightly, but I mean, if you read some of the articles, particularly by our national broadcaster, the CBC, I mean, it's outrageous. The, the first person transferred on the basis of self-ID was a man named Fallon Alby. He was a contract killer serving a life sentence, you know, for first degree murder. And you're reading the article, you would think that he was Rosa Parks. I mean, they wrote about it as great human rights uh, thing. So um, it's just these stories are passing people by and they're very meagerly, it's meagerly reported on. So yeah, it's really a long ways away uh, to get, I, I'm hopeful that it will break through soon, but it hasn't happened. Yet. Right. What do you think, Heather, have you seen, have you seen any changes in the media environment? Or the public discussion? Um, sorry, you were cutting it in and out a little bit there. I heard, oh, is this in the media? Yeah, do, do you feel like there have been any recent changes in the media environment or quality of public discussion around this issue? Um, so I noticed that a lot more people are starting about it. Um, there are a few it's still the same few though. There's like nobody new in the media that is releasing anything about this. It's the same couple that um, are willing to do something. But I think more women and more people are aware of uh, what is going on, especially since COVID and people are at home and online. Um, I think that, but there's so many people don't know. But there's a lot of people that don't care either because if it doesn't happen to them or they're not, somebody close to them isn't impacted by it, they really don't care. Right. Which, well, I find um, it, sho sorry. I find oh, it shocking ahead, that, that people, uh, people have an easier time grasping the, is the issue around sports. They have an easier time understanding that yeah. men don't belong in women's sports than in prison. And that makes me crazy. Like you try to stay calm about it, but it just makes me crazy. And I don't want to bore the pants off you with Canadian politics, but I'd just like to go back for one point for a moment where we're talking about the timeline, how Bill 616 was being passed and, you know, they came out with a policy not allowing self-ID. Then the prime minister comes in and forces self-ID. But before they'd come out with the policy, the correctional services saying that they weren't going to have self-ID, we had an article in the CBC where a representative for the minister in charge of public safety, so that would include prisons, announced that they would be changing the policy in regards to accommodation. So we have the correctional service 
drafting a policy, not allowing self-ID, and we have the government telling us a few weeks before that they're going to change it, and then we have the government then coming in and pretending that they're changing it on a whim. It's really something that I find staggering, right? If you can follow that, it's kind of uh, tangly. Huh. Which, which political groups and parties are, are pushing gender self-identification in Canada? Uh, the Liberal Party, the left-wing party, so it would be the Liberal Party and the New Democratic Party, but many Conservative members of Parliament voted in favor of Bill C-16 as well. So there's really no one, uh, you know, mounted much of a criticism. So kind of everyone? <laughs> All across the spectrum as well. Well, the, con the conservatives are floating around it almost like buzzards. They know there's something wrong here, but it's not a win win for them because uh, they, many of their mem members voted for it. And I, I spoke to a new Democrat MP during the last election and, and I told him I'd just gotten the grievance that Heather spoke about and it was really a disturbing thing to read. And I brought it up to him and he just said, Well, you know, it's really not something you bring up during an election. And this is someone who I'd always admired as like, you know, a left wing. His name is Jack Harris. He's an MP uh, for the New Democratic Party. So that would be like the left wing party. So uh, it's just, I mean, politicians, I don't know. I'm pretty disenchanted. Well, you know, I mean, it, it, we're hearing this just on a broader scale. I feel like it, it is a message that women hear over and over, you know, your message, your, your issues, your interests, things that harm you, you know, please don't bring those up at inconvenient times. It's just going to cause problems for everybody else, you know, um, and it feels like, uh, you know, I'm hearing little things like that now, you know, it's an election year. Yeah, this is important, but, you know, keeping Trump out is more important. And, you know, we, what we can't, talk about two things at the same time. But yeah, there's mm -hmm. this very strong feeling that any kind of criticism of even people who know that these policies are harmful, um, you know, are sometimes just sort of inclined to keep it quiet for now, because it, from my perspective, there's always going to be something like that, that people tell us is more important than, than women. <laughs> it's always, it's never going to be our time, our turn. So, and certainly not incarcerated women as you, you know, they're, they're out of sight and out of mind for most people in society, you know, and similar for women in shelters. So it's something that, um, you know, it's certainly a, a hurdle, but I'm, I'm surprised that your conservatives are so quiet about it because I think our conservatives are more confident in speaking out about these issues. At least some of yeah. them. Some of them, yeah. Well, I guess well, we just had a leadership uh, election for the, uh, the head of the conservative party. So they were all maybe being quiet, you know, for that. But I, yeah, it shocks me because it just that there isn't somebody in some party to say something because, you know, no matter what party you're in, I think anyone who takes a look at this issue could see that there's a serious, serious issue and that there's no one who will speak up. And I think it's a case of there, it's almost like diluted responsibility where, you know, people know there's an issue. Some of them have to know because they've had women, especially in the last couple of years, contacting them, but they just don't want to be the one to take the hit. But yeah, it does surprise me that there aren't uh, many conservatives, but there has been an MP, uh, MP Tamara Jensen, she's uh, supporting a petition uh, in regards to the conversion therapy bill. So it, there, I think it's, hopefully it's starting, the conversation can open up, but it's, the bias is so strong in Canada. People um, just, just I, I, so I dismissed it when Bill, Bill C-16 was being debated, you know, it was, you know, portrayed as just being about discrimination and stuff. So you just, it didn't sound like, an important thing so and that's a failure a lot of us made we just kind of went along with the media line we thought we could trust the media and i think people in canada are in for a real hard wake-up call to see how what has happened because from my perspective they they intended to transfer men from the start because by moving the way they did what it meant is that within a few weeks of the bill being ratified they had the transfer starting so it's just it's just you know wow that's, that's really shocking. I, and I, I remember following that debate a little bit and 
hearing people insist, you know, like you were saying, it's just about discrimination. And I think most people think that means, oh, well, you wouldn't want someone to, to who was qualified to lose their job over this because someone yeah. didn't like that they were dressing a little differently than their coworkers. Or you wouldn't want someone to get, you know, kicked out of their house and end up homeless because they have a quirky sense of dress or something like that. And I think most people feel like, yeah, that's fair. That's reasonable. And the, the media debate seems to relentlessly insist on it as anti-discrimination on that level where you're not, yeah. you're not being cruel to people. You're not, you're not punishing them in an untoward way for behavior that most people find unobjectionable if, you know, maybe a little odd. But actually what we're being asked to do is accept their beliefs at face value and take very serious, dramatic material action, like putting men in women's prison in accordance with their belief that their gender identity trumps the physical reality of their bodies. Yeah, yeah it's, there is a, it's wild. And also when this debate happened, uh, uh, you know, a University of Toronto professor Jordan Peterson spoke out about it and he's but he spoke about it from a view of compelled speech so that almost allowed the media like any debate that happened or happened around the idea of compelled speech was which is certainly important but it's certainly not the main problem with this uh, these bill and these policies that are resulted from it but yeah the media is still kind of they chose they kind of took that and ran with it so he was kind of a gift in a way to the gender lobby because he made you know he was able to package it in a different way hmm. right yeah, well, I don't know. It's we've we've had here we've had court decisions that, you know, like campaign contributions and you know feeding homeless people in the park have, have been considered like speech acts. And so I think our our jurisprudence takes a broader view of what what is considered speech necessarily. But yeah, it goes really far beyond that. Like as if any action that you take has to be an affirmation of this person's self-belief even when everyone knows that it isn't so everyone knows that yeah. matthew harks didn't suddenly become a woman when he changed his name to madeline harks but we have well, to act like it's true or it's discrimination well there's a, a sharp there's kind of a divide because i would say that most people are in that camp of we all know that matthew harks is still biologically male but then there's this small group of people who don't seem to know that and some of them are working for the government and some of them are working in universities and because I raised this issue at a uh, local university and I was told that you know people like Matthew Harks are women and I was just and these are intelligent people saying stuff like this so I really don't understand what has kind of gone along gone wrong but yeah and even trying to I spoke to a women's advocacy a group who advocates for women in prison and She's very sympathetic and could understand how someone like Matthew Harks or predators are a problem, but there's still the underpinning of they believe this idea of trans women are women. So, and you, so I don't, I find that difficult to wrap my head around. Right. Yeah. Because once you that, that, stop that talking is... about, once you stop talking about people as men, you get into a problem. Once we start using words like male bodied, trans women and trans identified male, people lose their ability to understand what the conversation is about, which is a conversation about men and women. Sorry, but I cut you off there, Heather. No, no, I was just agreeing with what you were saying. Um, even like how we have absolutely no organizations or anything supporting just women because trans women are women and there's no difference between the two of us. Like apparently our life experiences are the same, our pathways to criminality the same. Um, apparently there's no need to differentiate between um, us and them. Um, and it kind of just blows my mind that people expect me to just believe that because somebody feels something, then that makes it so. Um, it just, honestly, it just blows my mind. And I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't been in prison. Like, I still remember my phone calls home to my family trying to tell them this stuff. And like, they didn't even want to believe me at first because they just couldn't wrap their head around it. And like, I didn't, and after I left, it got worse, right? Because I left and more and more were transferring in. Um, so 
it's just until they do something, it's just gonna, they're just gonna keep transferring in and nothing's gonna be done for the women. Um, I, I, honestly, it's, I feel like our prison now is just um, a free for all. It's just yeah. anybody, whoever wants in. Well, people assume that there are these groups uh, who are advocating on behalf of women, but like uh, Heather, you were at the conference, the Elizabeth Fry conference, where they announced that they were creating like the trans policy. So have they come out with that yet? So it's CAFE, um, Naughty Fry, but um, yeah, their inclusion policy, but they're like revamping their organization right now. So they requested some non-binary and trans women to come help them with their new mission and vision. Mm -hmm. Hmm. So, I wonder yeah, so, how that's going to look. Yeah. So you had like a main uh, prison advocacy group listen to women say, you know, that they were concerned about it. Then they can come right out and say, no, but we're creating a policy that's inclusive of the transfers. So, I mean, there really is no one for these women to go to. Yeah, for a time in, in California, I think on a, on a just case specific basis, or maybe it was compelled um, by a court order or something like that, but there was uh, there was a man who was placed in a women's facility, and the only public information about that available was on this you know little amateur website of a women's uh, sort of incarcerated women's advocacy group. You know, pr I think primarily formed by women who are now out or who were families and who are trying to advocate for women. And gosh, it was it was quite a long time ago, um, you know, I want to say before 2012, where someone from within the facility wrote to their family member outside and said, you can't believe this. It's just absolutely insane. This person has been placed with us. And there was a little bit of, you know, outrage expressed on this, on this website. And then one day I go back to try to find that um, and it's just gone. It's, it's been disappeared from their website and any mention of transgender on the website of that advocacy group is in a positive light is, um, you know, talking about how they're subject to trans identified males. It's always trans, trans identified males are subject to greater instances of, of violence and, and sexual assault. And, uh, you know, not that that's, not that there's anything wrong with sympathizing with that, of course, but, you know, there was sort of a loss of focus on female, females, you know, on women and um, just no, no mention whatsoever of how, you know, transfers um, or how these proposed policies would, would affect every other woman in the facility. Um, and I have to assume that some person got involved in that group and said, whoa, we have to remove this transphobic, you know, stuff from the website because, and, you know, now they're just, now I imagine they wouldn't even dare to talk about it because as we know, women in the United States have lost their jobs and their livelihoods over speaking up about this issue. So, you know, someone who's, um, you know, even on the margins of society isn't going to be very willing to speak up about it. And, and that's exactly you know, what these women are. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's unbelievable. It really is unbelievable. And I, it, I've been looking into this now for about two years and I still have a hard time digesting that it's actually occurring. It's so outrageous. That was the Masbrook case, right, Jennifer? Yes, you're right. It's Richard, Richard Masbrook, who's change to Sherry Masbrook. And I, I, if I'm remembering right, this was someone who had even had full surgery and the, the complaint was about that he was still assaulting women with his hands. He was still a dangerous person um, to them. And it, you know, to your, to your point, April, yes, it does obscure it when we're not talking about just men because he, he's just a man who's been put in a women's prison, who's dangerous and entitled and has no sense of boundaries with others and is still going to be stronger than female prisoners and motivated differently and is still going to be dangerous. And there's not necessarily, even if there was a definition that was other than self-ID, 
that would keep women safe other than going back to a standard whereby you can't put men in women's prisons because it's not safe for the women to, you know, to like just say that we will be about protecting women in this conversation. Well, it's amazing. It's less and less yeah. conceivable. On the basis of nothing other than, you know, the idea that we have to be nice, all this has happened. Like, there's no evidence whatsoever, you know, that the, no, there's no evidence that anything was done to take uh, into consideration how this would affect women. And, and every uh, piece of legislation in Canada has to have a gender based analysis. And it, it's almost sinisterly comic, but the gender based analysis for our gender bill was suppressed. So even MPs and senators looking at the bill weren't allowed to see it. Hmm. So it's, it's almost, it's just, it's totally bizarre. Yeah, it's uh... I wonder um, if, you know, I'm, I've been working on a similar issue here in the United States to do with women's shelters. And some of the women who I've spoken with who had experience living in or, or volunteering in shelters talk about how um, just just knowing that there is a man there, even if he hasn't actually taken the taken any actions against them, it just uh, for some women they just they wouldn't be willing to even be there, and for other women, you know, if they were willing to stay in the shelter, it would just wreck their entire sense of psychological safety. Is there a similar um, you know, because we've mostly talked about women being concerned about actual acts of aggression and, and you know, voyeurism and, and exposing themselves and things like that. But what about just the presence of the man in a facility that women are used to being, you know, used to thinking of them as a women's facility? You, yeah, there are women who won't go into these shelters now because there are men there. And there was a woman who, I mean, Christy Hanna, who was at a women's shelter in, I believe, Ontario, and she objected to the presence of a man there because, you know, she was dealing with PTSD and all this stuff. Now she's supposed to share a room with a man. It was just too much for her, right? And and she contacted the Ontario Human Rights Commission to file a complaint. And because in the, you know, speaking to them to file a complaint, she referred to him as a man. They told her that they couldn't help her. They couldn't represent her because she was potentially discriminatory. That's the state that we are in Canada. So that's a, she made a complaint about that, and it hasn't come to fruition yet, but it, hopefully it will. And, but it's, uh, yeah, I know. Listen, I've used myself, I've used women's only uh, programs and stuff. And I know that if you're in a vulnerable position, it's hard enough to do that anyway. You know, but if there are going to be men forcing their, if a man can force his way into any place, any shelter, or any trauma group, or any in prison, you know, the women who have a choice, obviously incarcerated women don't, they're not going to go there. You know, it's just, it's what, this flies in the face of everything that's been, you know, the policies and what people have been taught about respecting boundaries and everything. You know, if you go into like, for instance, a woman's uh, rape crisis center, you go in there, a lot of these places, they will immediately lock the door behind you because they know they're dealing with traumatized women who are afraid of sometimes their partners or somebody, you know, coming to them. So like the level of, just care and stuff that's needed to deal with people and to help them. The fact that you would just allow any man who wants to, to just run roughshod over that. Um, and that's exactly what it is, what, you know, because we're talking about self-identification. So it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's staggering. Well, I assume that women in prison, it can't be any different there than it is here very much, that women in prison or incarcerated in, in facilities are, as a class, more likely, far more likely, I think, to have experienced all for, all sorts of trauma in their previous lives, right? So you can't even compare incarcerated women to the general population of women because the fact that they're there is a strong indicator that they've already had a lot of trauma in their lives. Yeah, forty percent of federally incarcerated women in Canada are Indigenous, and they're probably they're less than five percent of the population. So that's a massive like, over over representation. And we've recently had a big inquiry here on missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, and they were supposed to go visit prisons, but they cut it during citing time constraints, which I found you know, I guess maybe they didn't want to deal with any of these issues. But yeah, it's it's a lot of lip service is being paid to kindness and to being paid in Canada to reconciliation. But obviously not when you've just left all these women, you know, incarcerated women kind of twisting in the wind 
obviously, you know, so you're absolutely right that the rate of trauma is much higher for women in prison than in the general population. And the, the, yeah, the rates are actually really, really high. And when you get into like marginalized groups, like um, indigenous women or black populations, their rates of abuse are actually higher. Um, so we have anywhere from like 68% and up for either physical or sexual abuse, but pretty much everyone in there have through it. Um, and typically it's at the hands of a man, right? Or a person in authority or parental, like somebody with power. Um, and then also have issues with the guards, right? The male correctional officers that are inside, like we just had the sexual assault in Nova Scotia prison. Um, now there's a guard charged with a uh, historical sexual assault in um, Grand Valley in Ontario. So not only do we have to deal with correctional officers and male staff in prisons, but we're dealing with the new transfers as well. Um, so it's, it's really frustrating because we're all locked in there, right? Like we can't escape, we can't hide, we can't do anything. Um, we, and half the time we can't even speak out uh, because our, we're risking our parole and we're risking consequences. So um, we're just stuck there and we have to deal with it and we don't really have a choice in the matter. It's a real contrast where it seems like the only people whose concerns about sexual assault or harassment do get addressed are men. If they say it, you go, oh, well, you know, we have to overturn heaven and earth and upend our complete understanding of human reproductive biology and move them into a place where most reasonable people understand they shouldn't be. But if it happens to women, it's like, eh. People are, still, are pretending, almost. suddenly pretending they don't understand that, you know, there's a difference between men and women and that, you know, putting a male offender in a women's prison is not anything other than a disaster. I mean, anyone who doesn't immediately understand this, I question their sanity because it's just, it's so, it's such an obvious thing, right? And when I went back then, look, trying to look at the articles, see how this had been reported by the media, and I noticed that the current and the former correctional investigator you know, have supported and really championed this, this policy. And the correctional investigator is supposed to be separate from the government and they're supposed to, you know, deal with offender, a prisoner complaint. So even if you have the person whom you're supposed to appeal to is, you know, coming out full force support for, of this policy. So really incarcerated women don't have anyone to go to. That's a tragedy. The tragedy in every respect. And the Canadian Bar Association, so the, the, the attorney group, they, uh, I came across correspondence with them as well, pushing, supporting this policy. So it's, yeah, it's everywhere. Who are they even supposed to get representation from if you have a complaint? I, exactly, you know. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you both so much for bringing so much light to a topic that everybody seems to want to sweep under the rug. Um, really appreciate it and um, I'll leave it open. Did, did either of you had any, have anything more that you wanted to add that you think, like what would you most say to people in the U.S. considering going farther down the path that Canada has already gone down in this respect? I would say to be brave and speak up because uh, these women are counting on you. You know, they don't have anyone to speak for them. And uh, yes, just, you can't be afraid to speak your mind. I understand that it's really serious because people have lost jobs, you lose friends, uh, but you really have to speak up because it gives other people permission to speak up as well. And you'll find that they'll understand what you're saying, but the time is now because it's easier to stop it at the beginning. Right. Yeah, I would definitely say to scout, but also to listen, because nobody ever wants to listen to women in prison, right? Um, and also write letters, like write to all your officials, let them know, um, and, and do what April did. She found me. She wrote me a message on Facebook and was like, hey, were you in prison? Can you talk about it? And I, for six months, I left the message in my inbox. And then I went to the national conference in, um, for CAFES in June 2019. And 
I got blown out of the water at that conference and I got home and I ended up messaging April and I'm like, what do you want to know? I'll tell you everything. Um, but if she had not reached out to me, I probably wouldn't be where I am today speaking about this. I would have stayed by it because I didn't want the blowback and I didn't want the issues. But after that conference, I realized that there's nobody there helping those women. Those women have no voice. And I am an accessory if I just sit here and allow the, these things to happen to these women. I can't. I can't live with myself. So I'm going to speak out and I hope that everyone else speaks out because the way the government sells it is not the way that it's going to turn out because look at Canada. I was there. I saw it. <laughs> thank you, Heather. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to thank you guys for paying attention to this. It's really a difficult issue and you guys are doing so much great work. It's really encouraging to see. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're both very inspiring. We really appreciate it. Thanks for coming on with us today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.